Hello, welcome to VR Roundtable, episode 80. My name is Gary and joining me is Steve and Chris. Um, Anthony's unfortunately unable to join us this week, but uh, I'm sure he'll be back next week um, and we can catch up with him. Um, so we've got a few things to talk about this week. Uh, we're going to be talking about virtual reality news and games for the next hour and a half or so. But uh, Chris, how are you this week? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, I went to Six Flags yesterday with my girlfriend, which is super fun. Um I basically lost my voice. I'm surprised I have it today, honestly. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was a good time. Good stuff. Speaking of lost voice, I wasn't here <laughs> last week because uh, I lost my voice. I, I wasn't screaming on a roller coaster like you were, but I um, I don't know. It just one night last week, it just went away. Uh, I wasn't sick. It was kind of weird. But uh, I was thinking, oh, man, I can't do the show because if I don't have a voice, it's not going to carry over very well. Especially for those listening on the audio podcast, that wouldn't be any good at all. It wouldn't work at all, would it? No. <laughs> um, but yeah, Steve, so um, I just wanted to quickly mention as well that uh, because you sent us a message saying that you are building a new PC, uh, is this going to be a PC that you're going to sort of dedicate to VR? Or is it going to be used for a wide variety of things? Well, so yeah, the PC I'm using now, which is, is what I've been using for the last couple of years since I got VR, um, it it's also serves double duty as my my home server. So for my wife business, uh, she's a photographer, uh, amongst other things. And, and she, so she has a lot of data and she goes out and does a shoot, particularly a wedding. She'll come home with 50, 60 gigs worth of, of cards. So, um, it's very important not to lose that data. So I built a home server. Uh, I have like 13 terabytes worth of drives in it. And so, um, it worked out for us where we could build a new workstation. Uh, so I'm going to move the PC I'm on now to to server duty and, and sit behind me. And I, I didn't stage it for, for this show. It was kind of the area I built it in um, because I haven't switched over yet. But, uh, yeah, that's the PC behind me. I'm, I'm moving up to an i7 8700K, uh, DDR3200, um, water-cooled all-in-one. Uh, I did an RGB build because... Uh, I want to settle on a color scheme. I'm not into the whole rainbow changing color thing, but but I figured if I was going to build something new and I wanted to settle on a color scheme, I could that way. Yeah, that'd be cool. You'll be all ready for the next generation of graphics cards anyway. Uh, that'd be cool. Um, okay, well, let's get on with the show then. So we've got a few news stories to go through. The first one we wanted to talk about is Leap Motion. Um, and these are a company that have been around for a long time. They sort of started off with this uh, little device that you could put on a desk in front of you and it would track your hand movements. Um in order for you to sort of eliminate the need for a hardware keyboard or hardware mouse. And that was the dream of what they were trying to achieve. But then they sort of pivoted their company over to VR when the DK2 came out. They uh, allowed you to sort of mount it on on the front section of your uh, VR headset. And then it would track your hand motion within VR um, and give you sort of a representation of your actual fingers, your hands within VR. And it came with a piece of software that uh, sort of demonstrated this ability it was very very impressive i remember um i've got elite motion and i've tried it a few times it was really really good um but it does have a certain number of limitations now the reason we're bringing this up is because leap motion have now uh, sort of revealed some kind of ar headset which they are working on now what what they're doing with this headset is it's first of all it's tethered so it's connected to a pc it's not like a hollow lens or a magic leap but they're able to do this um without any constraints in terms of um like the hardware limitations because it's tethered to a pc so you don't have any onboard graphics or any onboard processing it 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 um, sort of bypasses these limitations that are in these standalone uh, AR headsets at the moment. But um, aside from that, they've also sort of removed any design constraints in terms of form factor because this this device looks uh, pretty odd. It's got very, very large um, sort of uh, transparent panels on the front which you can view the VR world. But the advantage of that is they have very, very high specs for, for this device. So let's just quickly run f through this. So um, it's a 1600 by 1400 per eye resolution uh, which can run up to 120 frames per second. It has a 100 degree field of view which is very comparable to to sort of the VR headsets that we have at the moment, the Oculus Rift, the HTC Vive, etc., which is far more than anything that we see on HoloLens or even Magic Leap. And it also, because Magic uh, Leap Motion started with this um, 
device as a way to track hands they've built this sensor into the headset as well so it actually tracks your hands in sort of a half sphere um in front of you so it's 180 degrees wide by 180 degrees high and you can it will track your hands now i'm sure steve is showing uh, some video footage of this at the moment and it does look very very impressive what they're doing the one thing um, as well, just uh, finally before I pass it over to somebody else, is the fact that they're able to manufacture this prototype for $100. Um, so all the parts, that's not making any profit on it or anything like that, but they're getting all the parts from various places and they can manufacture this for $100. What they have hope to do in, in for the future of this device is to hopefully attract some kind of manufacturers that want to take this design and then run with it and do various things you know may possibly change the form factor slightly and um change a few things with it but they're, they're showing this off as a proof of concept without any design constraints to really show what ar can do and it's a very very interesting uh, device to to see in action steve i'll go over to you first on this um we've spoken about ar so many times on this show and we all know the limitations with the standalone ar headsets this one sort of is taking it in a slightly different direction what do you think I think it's it's cool, right? Like like you say, we've we've talked about AR a lot on the show, and uh, I keep coming back to the same argument of it in general is, is the utility factor. It, it it opens the door for all sorts of things. Um, the first thing I think about is is ways to use it in business or or way to train employees um, because you get that information overlay. Uh, this product, um, I, I know it's not necessarily so they're aiming for it to be commercial and, and not at a hundred dollar price point, but if they have a hundred dollar all in costs sort of as is, it hints that whenever it's commercialized, whether it's by them or if they pass it off to another company, uh, that it's going to be very affordable. And, and, and that's also attractive. The, the downside being tethered to a heads to a, to a PC, uh, may limit some of the capabilities. You, you know, you'll have to kind of stay confined, um, using my previous example of training to a training kiosk training area um, but other than that yeah I mean why not it's already got a higher fove than ho hollow lens and, and, and all the other ones so um, there's benefits so um, I think it's pretty cool and uh, kudos to these guys and and hopefully uh, it grows from here yeah yeah Chris how about you yeah I mean I think Le um, I keep thinking magically but yeah leap motion is a really good company um, you know their their hand tracking stuff was really the best out of anybody's I think that's kind of the thing that they're trying to focus on, like getting people to actually be able to use their stuff. Cause right now, like, you know, you have HoloLens, you can like pinch or something. It's not very intuitive. And then it sounds like Magic Leap has this kind of controller thing. I think like actually using hands in AR is probably the best use case for it. Uh, so it's really cool that they have this. I kind of wish that they could release their newer like 2.0 tracker thing. Cause I remember they were talking about that. Like it has this you know, 180 degree field of view for like VR and AR applications, but they're only going to work with hardware manufacturers to like actually get it to market. So I kind of wish that was something I could buy right now, uh, just to at least try in VR. Because honestly, looking at the the videos and stuff of how good it tracks, like it looks like they made a lot of progress since like the last time I've tried it. Um, but yeah, if I could buy this for like 300 or 400 dollars, I probably would. I don't care that it looks ridiculous. Like the specs are insane and. I don't know. I think enthusiasts just want to see like what the future is going to be. We don't want it to be constrained by how good it looks or anything like that. So, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. Did a good job. I think it, it does. You're right. It does sort of give a glimpse of what's possible with AR and where we all want AR to get to at some point in the future. Um, this device, it's not something that will really go to like mass market or or attract any attention from the, from the mainstream. At least I don't think so because it looks so strange. But it it just it's just as a proof of concept and displays what AR can do. I think it's fantastic. Um, so I'd love to you know I'd love to give this a try. And from all the videos we've seen, it it seems to work so well. And as you mentioned, with the the hand tracking that they're doing and the things that like within the graphics that are being rendered, the occlusion, there's one section in particular where he's sort of holding a uh, cube and then moves his hand through the cube, this holographic cube. And it seems to detect his position of the, the position of his hand so accurately and seems to represent it so well um, in the AR display. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'd, I'd love to try something like this. Um, but yeah, it seems like it's, 
as we say, it's sort of a proof of concept and they're going to, this is an open source AR design as well. So what they're going to do, they're going to reveal plans this coming week, I believe. Um, so that for anybody that wants to manufacture this, then they can uh, go ahead and do that. Okay. Um, Let's move on to the next uh, little news story here. So we've got um, Cat VR now. This is the Catwalk Mini, which um, we I'm sure we must have spoken about this on the show at some point in the past. Um, but this was originally sort of pitched as a affordable uh, omnidirectional treadmill or slide mill. It's a kind of it, it. It doesn't have any moving parts or anything like that. So it's a you you have like a very low friction surface, as we've seen in something like the uh, Virtuix Omni, and then. It, this this one actually has some kind of support that you strap yourself to so you can move around uh, on the uh, surface relatively worry free you know you're probably not going to fall over because you've got this support behind you um now affordable probably isn't uh, what a lot of people are talking about at the moment with this now they were going to do a kickstarter which uh, was for three thousand uh, dollars if you wanted to pick one of these devices up. Um, but they did have an early bird offer for fifty percent off, which was going to be fifteen hundred dollars. Unfortunately, what they're doing now—well, I say unfortunately, it might not necessarily be unfortunate for uh, the long run of this uh, this unit. But uh, what they're doing—they're scrapping the Kickstarter because they have had some uh, outside investment, and they are going to just uh, manufacture these and then sell them. Now, when they go up for pre-order, they are still talking about quite a large discount on this device. So. Uh, you never know, we might still get it for the $1,500. Even at that price, there was a lot of people saying, you know, this is still too expensive for what it does. Um, and I, you know, I personally, I won't be picking one of these up for even $1,500. It just feels a little bit too expensive for what it is. I would absolutely love to try one of these uh, omnidirectional treadmills or slide mills. Either way, I think it's fantastic. And we've seen a lot of um, news about Infinidec uh, this past week as well. Uh, Tested had some hands on with that. And that was quite um, an interesting little video as well. So I recommend people go over and check that out. But um, just talking about this one in particular, uh, Chris, the so cat vr this catwalk mini there was this rumor that well this sort of pitch that it was affordable uh what, what do you think of this now they've revealed the price for it uh i don't i don't know affordable to me would be like 300 or 400 dollars for what they're giving they're giving um i just know like all these slide mill type designs aren't really that immersive and you kind of have to get used to them which really defeats the point like you can get used to them and it probably feels better than using a thumbstick but it doesn't feel like normal walking. Like I think Infinidec is the closest thing we've gotten to that. Um, I talked to Palmer Lucky a long, long time ago, and I did an interview, and I was like, what do you think of the, the omnidirectional treadmills? He's like, yeah, they're not very good, but don't tell anybody. But I feel like since he's not Oculus anymore, I can say that. But <laughs> it's just true. Like They're not that immersive. Like There's better things you can focus on and to try to solve the, the kind of problem of walking than uh, kind of these slide mill designs. Um, I don't know, 1,500... Maybe for like VR arcades, that would work. But for consumers, there's there's no way I would put this in my house. Plus, it's just too big, you know, too bulky. But yeah, that that's true. That's another point. Um, with all of these things, they seem to be very bulky and they're going to take up a lot of room. Um, but you know, some people do have dedicated spaces to VR that they, it could work for those people, and I understand that. But um. Yeah, Steve, I'll go over to you. You know, we, again, we've spoken so many times about these omnidirectional treadmills on the show before. Um, we've not really spoken about having any interest in getting one based on the problems that we, we've spoke about. Um, but Steve, what do you think of this? I, I, I stand the same spot I did before. And, and, and that spot that I'm standing is not on one of these treadmills. So it's... It... <sighs> I like the idea, and, and I'm not faulting anything Cat has done. Um, looks like they have a good product, and it looks like it's reasonably priced. I don't think it's at 1500 bucks. It's certainly not mainstream price. Uh, but for what you're getting, 1500 may be completely entirely fair. Um, I just kind of go back to, to the same point. We, we have several layers that, that a product like this needs to break through in order to be something that, that I would consider buying and and i'm a radical enthusiast with cash to burn so if it's hard to get me on board i can only imagine it's hard to get everyone else on board but the the things i i need to see is first and foremost i need to see content 
I, it's got to, you know, I, I'm showing the trailer now, and it, and it shows they're they're saying they work with PlayStation VR, Pimax, Oculus, Vive. Um, so 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 they're name dropping all of the main headsets and platforms, but that doesn't mean all games are going to support them. Uh, they're showing Fallout and Skyrim and Arizona Sunshine, and, and they're showing some very popular games. So um, I don't know that they haven't solved it, but but it has to to be native, and I have to have a reasonable expectation that any game I want to play. I'm going to be able to jump on my treadmill, my device, um, my cat, and, and play it. The second issue then is obviously size, and, and regardless of where they get with, with content, the uh, it's it's got to have a place to go. I could put, I don't, I don't think I could fit the um, Infinidec uh, anywhere in in my room, but I think I could fit this this cat, um, the the Catwalk Mini, and maybe it's a product, but but. Again, I'm I'm in a unique situation. I don't represent the six billion other people out there necessarily. So, um, just because I can fit it, I, it doesn't mean I think it's a commercial. Uh, it could be a commercial success. So, um, very curious as to who would buy one of these. Um, but I'd like to give it a go, as you say, Gary. Yeah, I mean, like the Virtuix Omni, for example, that thing had the early bird price at two fifty, and it's kind of similar. So are you going to spend two fifty? Are you going to spend fifteen hundred? Like I know you can't actually buy the Virtuix Omni unless like you're a kind of like a VR arcade now. It looks like I was checking out their website. Like you can't actually buy it as a consumer other than like if you backed the Kickstarter a long time ago. But I don't know. The price difference is kind of ridiculous if you compare the early bird prices with them both. I it looks like like you can't get like if you get this it maybe is like six hundred tops. Like if you were a VR arcade or something. So yeah, I, I think um, the Virtuix Omni as well. They sort of cancelled the pre-orders, uh, well, the Kickstarter backers for a certain number of people because they just couldn't ship them out. They couldn't physically do it for the price that they quoted. So I think they had to do that for them. And I, you know, this is not really anything against Cat VR because I'm glad that there are companies out there that are trying this kind of stuff. And I'm sure they would love to manufacture this device for three hundred, four hundred dollars and still make a profit on it. It's just not possible. That this there's a lot going on with it and even though it seems like a relatively basic design with it being a slide mill um there's still a lot going on with this thing and there's so much that they need to do in terms of r d and then source all the various components and this kind of stuff so this price is just what they're sort of forced to to sell it at and um it's unfortunate but um and honestly the, the fact that they're offering a 50 percent discount is an early bird seems to me that they will actually be losing money on those early bird editions and then hoping to win it back based on favorable reviews um afterwards it's a huge discount to give for an early bird now either they are ripping people off in terms of it being not quite as expensive to produce as um, i'm suggesting um, and they're able to offer that early bird discount and still make a profit on it or they're just going to lose money on those early birds because that that's really the the two scenarios around this um yeah again so just to reiterate i would love to try these i'd love to try the infinidec um that is a very very large device but um it seems to have the best design overall of all of them and i can only i mean god knows how much that will be if that ever uh, sort of uh, sort of gets some kind of consumer release um but um that tested video i don't know if we want to just quickly go over that i don't know if everybody's seen the video but it seems to work very well although there's still so many problems with the design that they have and they have to use vive trackers in order to as we discussed a few weeks ago they have to use vive trackers in order to update the uh, the the way that the treadmill works in order to adapt for the direction that people are walking in that kind of stuff um which seems to work a lot better but it's still not perfect and uh, the tested guys did did uh, talk about that in their video steve did you did you see the uh, tested infinidec video yes i saw it uh yesterday i think it was that i watched it and the one of the things that stood out to me the most was Jeremy was like losing his balance and, and sort of slipping up a little bit. And, um, I thought that was interesting because I've seen a couple other videos. In fact, I think we played it when we talked about it a couple of weeks ago on the episode. Uh, and, and in those videos, no one was kind of slipping and falling over. Um, so sort of a little side shout out to the, uh, what I feel is the honesty of the test it guys, you know, they, they, they showed the portion in the beginning that I think no one else showed and that's sort of getting acclimated and they didn't hide behind that. And neither did the, um, 
uh, the, the president or the CEO of, of Infinidec, he was kind of standing there and he's like, yeah, at first you have to relearn how to walk again on this. Um, so, so they're not hiding behind it. It's just, just, uh, open transparency. So, um, Infinidec itself and test its video. It, I, my opinion, <laughs> sounding repetitive but uh it is is still unchanged I, I don't know how you get these products into people's homes i don't know if that's even their goal uh maybe maybe infinidex focused on on arcades but uh, i think tested did a good job covering it and i would love to try one um so again coming full circle i'd like to try one chris did you see uh the tested video on the infinidex at all yeah, I didn't get to like finish or anything, but uh, you know, I agree with everything Steve said. Like it it's definitely an arcade solution. It's one I want to try real bad, but you know, I don't think it'd be consumerized anytime soon, but man, it, it's such a cool idea. Like I feel like that's the one idea that could be the most immersive out of all I've seen so far, so. Yeah, yeah. You you know the, the, just before we move on to the next news story, when I, whenever I think about these omnidirectional treadmills, for some reason, and I don't know why this will be, but going back years and years, I I just had this idea that these were just around. These were just uh, these were, had already been invented, and these were just ready to go. And I think that idea comes from the fact that like um, when I saw virtuality machines back in the day, where they were sort of on this platform with people with a virtual reality headset and a controller, I. Maybe in my 11-year-old mind, I just assumed that they were walking on this surface that was moving in, in all directions, but it's just a platform on those particular machines. So in my head, this is so, this was sort of a solved problem, but then obviously when I start to think about it and the, the difficulties involved in actually making this thing work the way it needs to work, it's, it's an incredibly difficult problem to solve, and hopefully a, a company will get there one day. Um, and there are various problems around it, even if it does get to it. So if you're standing in place and you're even if you've got the motion of walking, it could still present some kind of problems to certain people in terms of motion sickness, because if they're not actually moving in space, um, it can still sort of upset uh, some people, I would imagine. But uh, yeah, we'll see where these go. Hopefully they'll continue to uh, keep trying on this stuff. OK, so uh, a couple of smaller news stories that we've got down here is the... Um, so JPEG, Joint Photographic Experts Group. I didn't know what that stood for, but now I do. So JPEG revealed uh, JPEG XS last week. And this is a just a, you know, there's not too much to talk about on this one, but it's a visually lossless uh, compression standard, which will be ideally suited for something like VR and AR. And actually it's, it's, sort of aimed towards very low latency networks um so like 5g and we we i think we've mentioned 5g on the show a couple of times but um this is technology that will really impact various uh, areas of uh, of the tech world and so this uh, jpeg xs it supports up to 8k with frame rates of up to 120 frames per second um and it has a compression ratio of six to one so um, this is just something to keep in mind for the future. I don't know if we're going to see anything in the in the short term with this, but it's just worth mentioning because obviously compression is a big deal in terms of VR. As we all know, with wireless standards and this kind of stuff, um, we all need smaller uh, sort of uh, data to to transfer um, over over to these wireless networks in order to give us a, a very low latency update and refresh on our VR headsets. So it's all interesting stuff. Um, has anybody got anything they want to mention on this specifically at all? Nothing um, specific about about that other than the, um, I love the comment of a visually lossless compression standard. Like well, if it yeah. if it's compression, you know, it's like wasn't MP3 supposed to be an audibly uh, lossless yeah. compression standard? But you can tell the difference. So uh, I remain to I, I I don't think it'll it'll appear the same as raw, uh, but still it, it's cool. And um, you know, I think a lot of people are are, are expecting that a new codec such as this and, and being talked about, and um, that it's going to come out relatively soon. We we have they jpeg they have a long way to go before um you're going to see this in adobe encoders and you're going to see film in, in, in the industry as a whole kind of kind of embrace it um you know we're the i guess the latest and greatest that's being used sort of widespread is h.265 um and, and and whatever sub variants of that so um i think this is a, is a bit ways off before uh but it's good to see that uh the people that have have done this stuff before that know what they're talking about are continuing to push the compression industry forward because it's gotten a lot better and, and i don't know if you guys noticed it but 
think of, uh, I assume you have Netflix and, and or HBO Go and those sorts of things. Like, think of how your Netflix looks now versus how it looked, say, seven years ago or roughly yeah. around there when it first started to come out. Like, Netflix has done a good job pushing the compression technology. And um, I used to try to get Blu-rays for, for whenever we were going to watch a movie down, down in my theater here in my house. And because I could tell a difference with, with Blu-ray. Um, and now it's gotten to the point where Netflix does such a good job, especially with their 4K content, uh, that, that, you know, compression is meaningful and we'll see the benefits of it. So, uh, that's where I'm going with that thought. And, and it's good to see that, that people are thinking ahead, uh, or, or more or less confirmation that people are thinking ahead and, and we'll see where JPEG excess goes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, takeaway for me is that JPEG stands for Joint Photography Experts Group, but I agree with everything you said, Steve. That's crazy. But yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to it. Um, we'll see where that that goes. I guess I'm wondering if like Oculus will come out with something because I know they're always working on all this compression stuff too. Wonder if all these people are gonna try to like make the best algorithm and it'll be like a little war. But we'll see who comes out on top. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> All, all, all this talk of compression standards and this kind of stuff, it always gets me thinking back to like TP cast and this kind of stuff. And uh, I still don't want to jump, jump in on it, but I'm very tempted at times, I've got to admit. Um, I, I read some reviews and they talk about it, how it sort of revolutionizes their VR experience of people that, that pick up this TP cast. Um, but then you've got the limitations of it as well, where the, the setup itself is not particularly great. Um, you've got all these extra things going into your PC. And also the fact that it appears that you lose a few degrees field of view as well, at least from some reports that I've read, um, because it, it cuts off the edges of the screen in order to get it to transfer fast enough to the headset. Um, but yeah, it always gets me thinking of this stuff and it's still too expensive for me to sort of jump in and try. But uh, again, this is another one, you know, I'd love to try a TP cast um, and, and really see the difference of that kind of stuff. OK, uh, well, let's get on to this one now. So Oculus Studios. Um, now, Twisted Pixel. OK, so Twisted Pixel released a uh, uh, Wilson's Heart, which was an Oculus exclusive last year. Was it last year or was it the year before? Last year, yeah. Um, yeah, and this was actually one of my favourite games of last year. Um, I thought it was absolutely fantastic, not without its small problems, but I think it was a, a really good game. And so what they've now revealed is their next project, which is called Defector, and it appears that they've sort of really upped their game, um, even beyond what they did with Wilson's Heart. And this game seems to place you within the role of some kind of super spy, and it sort of... It appears from the tape uh, from the trailer to be sort of a little bit tongue in cheek and you know not taking it itself too seriously or anything like that. But it looks like a very very interesting game, and the fact that it's coming from Twisted Pixel, who made one of my favourite VR games, um, I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, Chris, did you see this trailer? What do you think? Yeah, it looks super cool. It's cool seeing something from them in color in VR. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, the graphic style I think looks really awesome and. Just kind of like the narrative aspects, you know, they're so good at the, narr the narrative stuff. And I don't know, like, this, I'm really excited for this just because I know how good Wilson's Heart was. You know, it was one of my favorite games, too, although I hate horror games. It's just so good, like, having those characters um, talk and everything, like, really amazing. And from this trailer, you can see a lot of character interactions that look really nice. And, um, yeah, it'll be, it'll be cool to be a super spy. When does this come out? Is there, like, an announce date? I don't think there is yet, right? I think I they, they've so. only said 2018 is all they've said. There was um, a lot of, of, of large media outlets that got access to this. I, I guess it was launched at PAX East is, is when they really kind of came out and, and revealed it. Um, um, so, so there's some gameplay videos that you can find on, on YouTube. I'm showing the trailer now. But when I saw this, uh, I guess it was a couple of days ago when I saw it. And I, I, was, I, was, I got excited because, uh, like you... I really liked Wilson's heart. Uh, Wilson's heart had issues. Uh, it was black and white, although I think that fit. Like, I don't consider the black and white a critique. I, I know some people would. Uh, but the big critique that a lot of people had and was, was the locomotion or the lack thereof in Wilson's heart. And it's like they twisted pixel listened to it and and it kind of listed their weak points up on a on a whiteboard in a, in a conference room meeting and said okay guys let's do a complete 180 from, from these weak points so it's very vibrant and colorful uh and you want to talk about locomotion i mean you 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 drive a car off of a cargo uh, uh 
ramp off of a plane <laughs> while diving into another one so um there there's your locomotion uh so uh i'm pretty excited for this and it looks like um it's gonna borrow like some of the combat it's seen where you're like kind of grabbing a guy by by what looks like a backpack strap and punching him and um it, that was some of the mechanics i can i can see the root of wilson's heart in there i remember some of the uh enemies you battled in, in that game uh the one where you had to deal with the grenades in particular you had some sort of melee type combat before you were throwing grenades and and i can see that core in there so and i thought it was really well done in wilson's heart so i can imagine it's going to be really well done here so uh really looking forward to this one it shot up um pretty high now and into my most anticipated of 2018 yeah me too actually yeah i'm really looking forward to this one and i agree with your point there because i didn't think about that but you can see although the game looks very different from wilson's heart you can see some of the dna in the gameplay uh certain sections within that trailer um and actually on some of the action sequences within wilson's heart i don't think they were all perfect in fact i think some of those were probably the weakest parts for me not not all of them but i think certain sections were probably the weakest part in terms of the action um however i think that what they've shown in this trailer means that they they're sort of progressing in the right direction in terms of that can't wait for this um yeah i'll keep uh, keep an eye on this one okay uh well we want to talk about games um after steve uh just wants to have a quick discussion because you were sent some uh is it i saw your email to this uh these people widmo lens or vidmo lens uh, adapters <laughs> for the rift why don't you yeah. tell us a little bit more so um so it's a Polish company. Um, you know, I think we would call it Widemo, Widmo. Uh, but I, I asked them for the pronunciation. I didn't want to misspell it, but Widmo uh, is kind of how they said it and how they would say it in, in, in Polish. So Widmo, Widmo. Uh, anyways, they sent me uh, their company. They make some VR uh, covers, some wraparound cloth covers and, and various other products. But they sent me... Um, the the prescription lens inserts for the oculus rift and uh I, i've talked about it i know multiple times on the show um i wear glasses obviously as everyone can see for those on the audio podcast i wear glasses uh and i'm not a candidate for contacts because of this um my corneas are slightly misshaped with with uh this thing called keratoconus anyways um so fitting glasses and kind of dealing with that in vr is is a continual problem that i have and 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 i'm lucky that um i believe i have a small head my ipd is only 61 and a half millimeters and i know ipd doesn't mean you have a small head uh, but i believe i have a small head based on reading how other people describe various vr headsets fit like i can squeeze these glasses and my face comfortably into a rift whereas a lot of other people will describe it there's no way you can fit glasses in there um so regardless, even though I'm comfortable with um, wearing glasses in my headset, it's still sort of convenient. Sometimes when I take the rift off, it'll it'll pinch and kind of just take my glasses with it. Um, you know, that happens about every other time. Um, so I, I've been trying out these uh, prescription lenses from, from Vidmo. And it snaps right into the wrist facial interface. And uh, although they're somewhat of a competitor with uh, VR covers uh, in where they have a, an overlap, I, I found that uh, Vidmo's uh, prescription insert also fits well into the VR cover facial interface. So if you have that, uh, I'm liking that as well. So um, I'm still very early with it. I, I kind of told them I'd talk about it, give initial impressions, and then maybe uh, talk about it more in depth next week or on a future episode. So, so far, I'm really liking um, the product. Uh, I've, I've only got a couple hours with it, so I have to spend more to it, but, but it is a very drastic improvement in my process getting in and out of it it's not really any faster but it's that um that sort of mental annoyance i know i can just yank the headset off and on now just just like you guys who don't wear glasses you just pop it on and go um i can now do that and in fact i catch myself sometimes for you know when i'm coming out that i don't have to be so subtle now i can just yank it off a little, little quicker i'm still kind of retraining uh my brain so to speak so um look out for more uh coverage and, and more impressions on these uh lens adapters in the next coming weeks cool i should give impressions on the widmo vr cover that i got sent a really long time ago <laughs> i just remembered um <laughs> So they, they sell this VR cover, you know, like I, I have had VR covers. We've talked about those in the past. Um, I think as like a cheap option, if you don't want to actually get the full facial interface, their, uh, their Rift cover is a lot uh, 
more kind of advanced than the VR cover one just because it has elastic bands that like keep it in place whereas with the old VR cover ones they would like come off all the time so that was like a really big improvement for me um I ended up using VR cover ones more because the fabric was nicer but on the website it says they have much smoother fabric on their rift covers now so I think like if you just want a really cheap like twenty dollar you know cover for sanitary reasons I would probably go with Widmo just because it really is secure like they have all these rubber bands all over it that keep it to the facial interface but obviously if you want a whole new facial interface then i think vr cover is still kind of better but i just want to throw that out there <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's good impressions as well um but um just quickly going back to the lens adapters steve there was um you know so you clip these in and then if you want to demonstrate the vr to somebody somebody coming over they p- relatively easy to sort of just quickly yeah, so you know how easy you pop the facial interface. Uh, I have my my original facial, so I don't have the lens adapter here with me. But the it just kind of there's this kind of open cavity right under here, and you kind of get your bearings where I'm talking about. It's kind of under this lip. Uh, for those on the podcast, sorry, I'm I'm visually showing. Uh, it's, it just pops in there. There's no attachment. There's no anchoring anything. Um, so what my plan was is I'm using the my red facial interface from VR Cover with my prescription lens inserts, and I was actually gonna maybe put a little dab of hot glue on it just so it stays together. And then when my kids or my wife plays, I just rip that off and just throw this one on. So. It, I kind of stick with with one there uh, and it works really nice I mean again it, it fits both facial interfaces uh, re- really well which I wasn't expecting that I, I was expecting that maybe it would only work with the original rift interface um, but nope that's not what I'm finding so uh, really liking the product a lot yeah excellent yeah well uh, I'll look forward to hearing your impressions on that um, probably when you've spent a bit more time with it because there's so many people that um, use vr and have this problem with glasses fitting in certain headsets and not in in other headsets and this kind of stuff so hopefully this is a solution for them uh, in the long run okay so let's get on to some games that we've been playing now the first one we want to talk about is one that we actually discussed last week skyrim vr we just want to carry on with our discussion on that and also get into some mod talk now I, I said on last week's show that I wasn't going to dive into mods and this kind of stuff, but the temptation got a bit too much for me and I had to go in um, and I've downloaded, I'm just looking at the, so I've got 36 installed mods at the moment and uh, 24 active. So I've disabled a few of them that I tried. Um, I think I'm done. I think I'm done, but we'll see because uh, it's very easy to just keep adding them in there, to be honest. Um, but Steve, I'll go over to you first on this. Um I know that you had modded Fallout 4 before, um, so I only expected you to do Skyrim as well. What do you think of the effect it has on this game uh, from the vanilla Skyrim? So, I mean, I, th- I think Skyrim modding goes goes further back. So a, a, a little background with me. I, um, I, I've always sort of played traditional flat games on on a console uh in fact i never really did any pc gaming until 2016 when i got my vive so this whole idea of modding and i know you can mod now um i think bethesda gives mod capability straight to xbox and stuff but i never really got into that so modding is a relatively new concept for me uh with fallout 4 as we all know the performance was was pretty bad um so i look towards modding not because i really wanted to change the experience but i was looking for it um for optimization improvements that the community have found and and when i dug in there i, I started to like it and i sort of sort of um under started to understand how it all worked uh with fallout 4 i did everything manually um i tried i tried nexus originally but it was kind of put off by the having to copy and paste your plugins folder and it, it was just sort of a a, a hassle uh, so I just sort of did everything manually with Fallout but with Skyrim um, a, a new mod man a relatively new mod manager uh, Vortex uh, was was ready and uh, I, so I came out of the gate using Vortex and and I absolutely am recommending Vortex um, to to everyone it's technically in alpha uh, but it is a mod manager and, and what the mod manager does is you can load files into it um, that you download from Nexus uh, or get any other way um, 
and, and it'll handle your mods for you. It will turn, you can turn things off and on at will a little bit easier. Uh, and, and more importantly, it, it sort of has a loot integration in it. And loot is a, is another piece of software that a lot of people using Nexus mod manager will use. And, uh, what loot does is it's a load order optimization. So certain mods you want to load after other mods, um, you know, just so it's last to load because that's the, the, texture or, or whatever it is that you want to see. So I'm using Vortex and, and I'm really liking it uh, with Skyrim. So both with Fallout and with Skyrim, uh, a little more continual background, I hadn't played them in their entirety. Uh, I played Skyrim VR on PSVR, which of course you can't mod there. And what I wanted to do is I sort of leeching off of Fallout 4, I wanted to uh, just kind of improve the visuals a little bit, just kind of take advantage surprisingly with Skyrim just flat out like I thought it would work better than Fallout uh, but I was shocked at how sputtery smooth it was and I realized I had tons of hardware overhead um, because I wasn't really stressing anything out I, I was not going into asynchronous space warp so uh, I, I very quickly after an hour or two of Skyrim realized I had headroom so I set out to start looking for high-res textures and there's a subreddit uh, of Skyrim VR that that has people just kind of going crazy with, with mods and, and everything there. So my goal with, with modding is to not change the experience in terms of gameplay or anything. I want to experience Skyrim as Bethesda sort of intended. Uh, but at the same time, if I have headroom and I can improve on some optimizations or I can make textures look a little better, make people look a little better. Uh, people are one of the things that a lot of people critique Skyrim for. It looks pretty dated in there. So there are a lot of mods where you can improve the, the look of, of the NPCs in, in this world. So that's, that's what I want to do. And the one gameplay thing I did change was easy lock picking um, lock picking just kind of pisses me off both in fallout and in skyrim um, so I, I quickly disabled that so um, we can talk about some of the mods I, I think i think we're going to run relatively short on content otherwise this week so i think we can spend some time talking on the mods themselves i know we've had uh, a few requests so um, yeah i'm I'll... just gonna say as someone who hasn't modded I, I need to know from you experts on what i should get to make skyrim look better because you know Good. i yeah yeah, no, ju just actually quickly before we go into the mods, I was going to ask you, Chris, because I know you've not got gone into sort of modding Skyrim at all. Have you ever done any sort of, because I know you were big into Minecraft and that kind of stuff. Did you get ever get into sort of modding Minecraft and that kind of stuff at all? I, I used to mod Minecraft. Yeah, that's true. Um, I, you know, I used to like install the shader packs where it looked like it's ultra real and all that stuff. So yeah. I, I, I have done a lot of modding on there, but I I'm, I'm really want to try it with Skyrim because I do want to keep the base experience, but like, you know, I, I want to push my graphics card a little bit, like, because it does run okay. I don't know. It, right now, it looks a little, a little eh. Like, I think the NPCs maybe is the biggest thing. So. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, and actually, we, we'll go on to mods first, but because Steve wasn't here last week, I do want to just get on to his overall impressions of Skyrim as well. But but let's uh, do as Steve suggested. Let's go through some of the mods that uh, we've installed so far. Uh, Steve, why don't you go ahead? Okay, so uh, I'm not going to list everything out. In fact, I don't even have a count um, of, of how many mods. I, I put it in the 20 to 30-ish mods range. Um, you'll see a lot of people on, on Reddit and on YouTube talking about having 200 mods, and, and I think it's perfectly viable, and, I, and I, I definitely believe those people, and they say it's running buttery smooth. Um, I, I have no reason to doubt that. Uh, however, I think those people are probably the type of person that's played Skyrim to death. Um, so when they look to mod, they don't mind really changing the experience dramatically uh there are some mods that uh where you can basically uh bring uh Geralt uh, I think that's how you say, say his name the lead character yeah. from Witcher 3 uh I've seen mods that have Thomas the Train engine in it like so at that point you're kind of just doing something so so different from the experience of Skyrim but uh some of my big mods I'll kind of just uh throw them out there uh the first one that I did um was achievement enabler because I didn't want by having mods I, I, achievements don't really matter but if I'm going to play a game I might as well get the achievement so I did achievement enabler so I would continue to get my achievements um, even though I wasn't cheating per se um, and then I did um SMIM, I forget exactly what that stands for, but that's models and textures. It's 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 just an improvement to the mesh and some optimizations there. Yeah, uh, static static mesh improvement mod. That was one of the first ones that I I got to. Um, it was highly recommended that one. 
And uh, and then I did, uh, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, but WICO or WICO, it's W-I-C-O. Uh, and, and what that does is that really changes the, the NPCs a lot. Uh, I remember playing uh, Skyrim VR on PSVR and you get to a point where you get your first companion, Lydia, and now <laughs> get into that same spot on, on, on uh, uh, PC VR uh, using this Wiko mod, uh, Lydia looks entirely different. She's kind of attractive now, whereas she was sort of a, a blob <laughs> on, <laughs> on PlayStation VR. Uh, so, so big improvements there. Uh, I'm using enhanced blood textures, uh, which is uh, just gives it more blood. Um, I, I, I'm fighting a troll or something and, and, and shoot. Uh, I'm doing archery a lot, archery and, 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 and uh, being a mage. Uh, but when I use archery, uh, the blood, you know, I can really tell I'm hitting the, the, whoever I'm shooting. Um, I am using, uh, 3d plants and 3d trees. Um, it's giving 3d trees, especially I really like, um, when you make the trek up to, I think is it Hothgar or Hrothgar, um, yeah. where you go meet the, the gray beards. Um, it's a, it's up the top of a really big mountain, maybe the tallest in Skyrim. And, and it turns into an sort of an Arctic, uh, snowy frost area. And you get these really big pine trees and, um, the, the pine tree, the branch, branches get get sort of clogged with snow um, and you get a really nice depth there uh, Skyrim is a game that is much older um, than Fallout obviously but I think Skyrim special edition with all these mods like I don't feel like there's a drop off in quality between Skyrim and Fallout which really kind of it bugs me about how, how poor Fallout runs it looks better. It looks better to me, especially with these mods. But even without the mods, I think it looked pretty good compared to Fallout 4, the, the base Fallout 4 VR, at least. Um, I'm using Realistic Water 2. Uh, I've read since installing it that some people don't like it. Uh, I have to fool around there. Uh, I am using uh, another good one, I think, that sort of serves a purpose, is the Obsidian Mountain Fogs. And what that is, is compared to the PlayStation VR version, you have a much further look distance or uh, draw distance in, in PC uh, VR Skyrim. And however, um, when you're looking off at the mountain range, it's sort of on the other side of, of the world of, of Tamriel, you'll see some flicker where I guess certain things aren't loaded right. Um, people are experimenting with some fixes on that. Um, but uh, from what I understand, it, it has... is bothered the base you know flat version of skyrim so i wouldn't hold my breath at, at anyone being able to make that go away uh so what obsidian mountain fogs do is it draws um a fog around all the mountains a, a very natural looking fog that, that you would expect to see and it sort of just masks a lot of that flickering uh so i really like that one sort of just for its the immersion factor that it's not like I'm ooh and aah and at all of the fog, but the fact that I'm not seeing things flicker that sort of kind of take you out of the experience. Um, the uh, I think I mentioned easy lock picking. It, it just cheats the lock picking a little bit. Um, and then I'm using uh, a couple other small ones, uh, book covers and HD road signs and birds of Skyrim. It's just to add a little more a little more life to the world. Um, and then the, I guess, oh, I missed two. Sorry. Uh, I got to throw these in. Uh, a quality world map. So in, in your main world map, you, you, it, it's very black and white and, and sort of monotone ish colors. It's very different than, than what they did in Fallout 4. Um, so what, um, a quality world map does is it gives the the world map that you bring up some color and you can see the roads and you can see the water uh, you just get a little more detail so if you're trying to chart your way you're trying to go to a, a town that you've never been before and, and you, it's not all too hard to sort of get twisted up and in, in your direction a little bit so this just makes it a little bit easier to get your bearings and and sort of chart what course you're going to go. Okay. I'm going to go to this town. Do I want to go around this mountain? Do I want to go through it? And, and sometimes if you make a choice to go through a mountain and then you, you spend 10, 15 minutes getting somewhere and then realize you can't get over it. Um, it can be frustrating. So this kind of just helps you chart your, your courses a little bit. And then the, I guess the last one I'll talk about, cause I'm running on very long here, uh, is JK Skyrim all in one. And that's, um, sort of a town overhaul it, it just fills out the town each town or most of the towns uh with with a lot more detail um it 
you, you get additional banners hanging off of the buildings, maybe a little more plant life, a little more textures, just more objects. The the towns seem a little more full. Um, so I, th I thought that was a good one. Yeah. You've you've basically gone very similar uh, route to me, to be honest. Um, the only other one I didn't hear you mention is um, the realistic overhaul uh, texture mod. Um, now, originally I installed the Skyrim 2017 textures, um, and I wasn't too impressed with that, um, but I thought I was in the minority. But it turns out that a lot of people have sort of said, you know, if you go for this realistic overhaul uh, texture mod, which is in three parts, and then you download a patch, which then updates those three parts as well. Um, and it, it, to me, it looks a lot better. Um, I don't know, what, which one did you go for out of those two, Steve? So so what I did is I followed what some uh, I followed a thread on subreddit where people were talking about. It. So the 2017 textures people are not liking in VR uh, quite a bit, and I had started there. Um, and after some things were pointed out uh, as being not so good with that one, I realized it. So I am doing. Um, I mentioned SMIM, uh, and then I load up uh, Skyrim Realistic Overhaul next. And then I load up after that uh, Noble, uh, which is just gives it a little certain specific things that Noble addresses. Um, I'm trying to find the, what the full thing is. Oh, it's acronymed here, but it's Noble something um, Skyrim Special Edition. So uh, I actually have multiple texture things, but they're they're ranked in in an order so that you you're able to cherry pick uh, what you want from from each one of those. Yeah. Yeah, like I say, and I, I agree with what you were saying originally about um, how you've gone mainly for sort of the aesthetic kind of mods, and that's the way I'm going as well. I want to keep the game pretty much as it is. I just want it to look a little bit better in VR, and that's pretty much what I've what I've uh, tried to do through these uh, mods. So, Chris. I know you've mentioned, you know, with Skyrim, because the, the sort of the base game itself, um, it sort of opens itself up in terms of allowing you to uh, sort of maybe ramp up a few of the settings just in the game that it offers anyway, because it, it's not quite as demanding as I expected it to be. Um, so what kind of things would you be going for in terms of modding? Is there anything in particular from, from what we've said um, of the mods that we've installed? Is there anything in particular that you think you'd go for? I mean, I'd try all of them because I want yeah. to make the graphics look as good as I can. But I know I probably won't be able to ramp it up as high as you guys can with some of these, you know, texture mods and stuff like that. Um, are there any like VR specific mods that like are out or that help with anything? Because uh, it sounds like to me like you guys are happy with like all the VR stuff. There are, I think, uh, some some more tweaks so you have modding which is where you download and you mod the game uh but then you have i and i tweaks which at i and i is i guess it stands for an initialization file it's basically um a text file with all sorts of various parameters that the uh game then when you when you turn on skyrim it, it kind of calls some of those preferences it's um not all too different than if you were to adjust your graphic settings, you know, uh, presets, you know, medium, high, ultra, or whatever. Those type of settings will, can be stored in a configuration or in an, an initialization file. So you can go in and you can edit the INI and kind of do some scale tweaks, height tweaks. Um, you can adjust the, the, the angle of the bows. Like some people, myself included, I didn't like how the bow felt with the rift controllers out of the box. Um, so you can kind of tweak the, the angle. Um, uh, so those are, it, it's technically making a modification, uh, but when someone says mods, I don't think they're referring to I and I tweaks. Um, so, so you can do that. And those are more VR centric and, and some people are releasing skins so that, um, these Bethesda games, Fallout does the same thing. When you don't have a weapon in your hand, uh, it just, instead of reverting to hands of some sort, it just starts showing your, you, your touch controllers or your Vive wands. Uh, for me, I, I'm not too worried about that, but, but I get how some people will feel like the experience is really broken. Um, they don't like it. So you can get some, some skins for your controllers that appear as hands instead of as a Vive wand and such. Yeah, I was going to mention the bow thing. I've always felt a little bit off to me, so that's good that there's like a tweak I can do for that. Yeah. Have you um, tried experimenting with soup sampling at all, Chris? Not really. No. No, no. Because uh, that's uh, I, I went on 
far too long last week about super sampling but you know to me in this game it's that it's one of the biggest difference even taking mods into account i think that going from the psvr version to the pc version and having that ability to super sample it to make it much clearer um is the one of the biggest impacts for me and you can just do that within the menu so i definitely recommend sort of trying that out and just seeing what what kind of uh, how high you can get that uh with with your rig um but yeah I- so so gary are you um are you super sampling in the the super sampling in game menu or are you just kind of leaving it at your cuz i i have a 1.5 super sample set in oculus tray tool and and with this game i'm kind of leaving it and and i did that with fallout as well i left it at at 1.5 but my fallout i and i was like 0.8 or or something mm. so that by the time you you stack the two together um it was at a much much lower rate um yeah i i yeah i know what you because i did exactly the same as you in fallout with this particular game i don't know now i don't know whether for some reason i think it, i'm getting more of an impact if i do it within the game now what i've heard is you can do various things outside of the game to do the super something like the oculus tray tool um thing are you certain that actually makes a difference in this game um i presume it does because it seems to do it in sort of globally within games but i've heard some comments say that that doesn't make a difference my my understanding is that anything piped to the rift will pass through uh that's why asynchronous space warp works with any game regardless if you're playing on the oculus store or from steam if you're using a rift then it'll pass through. In fact, if you are sa- if you have super sampling set in Steam VR, say you have a 2.0 there, which is where when I had a Vive, where I would set my super sampling at, uh, and you have it set at say 1.5 in Oculus Tray Tool, that they will stack, and okay. and then give you all sorts of of performance hell because at that point you're running like a 4.0 multiplier or something. Um, so, so my understanding is, is yes, I could experiment, but I've had mine at 1.5 in the trade tool for six months and haven't touched it. I probably should go in and, and touch it and see <laughs> <laughs> sort of what yeah. happens and make sure it's still working. Um, but, but this game looks sharp. It looks, it looks great to me. Yeah. Um, so I, I kind of have a feeling that it, that it's working. Um, well, what? no, go ahead. I was going to say, but I'm I'm performing buttery smooth. So what I may do is just go into the Skyrim menu and turn up super sampling until I start seeing performance issues and, and then back it down from there. Yeah, I've I've done exactly the same as you. So I'm running a 1.5 as well in Oculus Tray Tools. And then, but I have increased it in game as well slightly. Um, and occasionally I will get this um, slight performance hitches by increasing the super sampling. And there was one thing I wanted to mention, actually, I think we had a comment on it on last week's show about the, um, the what's it called? The uh, pixel density, the automatic. Um, I disabled sort of that crap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's something that you, that you probably need to do and then just or, then lower your super sampling down to a point where you're not getting any performance issues um, because it, it does, it, it affects things um, beyond where you want them to be. So you'll, you'll get a lower resolution for, for certain scenes and it's, it's perceptibly not lower. You know, you can really notice the difference when it, when it does it. So I, I recommend disabling that and then just adjusting your super sampling settings um, based around that really until you're not getting any performance issues. Um, that's the way I've been playing it. And, yeah, there's a lot to say about this game because it is so it runs so well on such limited hardware. Even if you've got sort of a low end graphics card or anything like that, you can still get this game running really, really well. Um, so I, I just wanted to quickly, Steve, um, talk about your initial impressions of well, your overall impressions of Skyrim as a game on PC compared to the PSVR. So what I'll say is, um, you know. In, for people that listen to us every week, I, I'm going to repeat myself on some things I've said before, and you, you can roll your eyes and <laughs> go, I've heard Steve say this before, uh, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, so with PlayStation VR, I sort of settled in on playing Skyrim with a gamepad. And, and my main critique with, with Skyrim on PSVR is that, um, you know, if I wanted to use a spell uh, particularly, I couldn't the way I play in, in, in Skyrim really is, you know, if I'm shooting a spell, my lightning, my fire, whatever, um, 
I'll sort of backpedal from the enemy. A lot, a lot of enemies are faster than you, uh, and and you need to to keep from taking damage. You need to backpedal. You need to get away from them. But you don't want to just turn around and run. You want to have some offense as you're backpedaling. Uh, on PlayStation VR, you can't really do that with the move controllers because you got to point your controller in order to to locomote. Um, with playing it on the Rift and on PC VR, that, that issue is largely solved because you can continue to aim uh, your spell while pressing down on your thumbstick or on the trackpad, and, and you can backpedal and you can sort of navigate and move around while, while also aiming. Unfortunately, um, it's not perfect. Uh, well, I think it's about as good as they can do. I don't think they're going to be able to fix this. Um, it, it, it works okay as a mage, um, but if you are using, say, a, a sword and shield, you can't really locomote because you can't really use your shield in, in any sort of meaningful way while while trying to strafe or or or, or backpedal. Um, so it's it's somewhat still flawed in, in that sense. Um, and and it's not a big deal. I don't use a sword and shield that much. Um, typically, I guess if you're going to use a shield and you're going to try to try to block, you're not going to be trying to move while doing that. So it's it's not as big a deal. But I, I tend to stick mostly to archery and and magic. Um, so so yeah, I think it's loads better than than PlayStation VR, both in controls and performance and optics, and in just about every way. This is the premium version of Skyrim VR um, by a pretty good margin. Uh, I wouldn't recommend uh, anyone that has a, a, a PC headset and a PlayStation headset to play it on the PlayStation headset. Still a great game. Like if you only have PlayStation VR, uh, Skyrim is, is, is still pretty, pretty awesome. Like you should be playing it if you haven't. Uh, but if you have a choice, yeah, you, you should probably go PC VR. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, I think it's, uh, and I said it last week, you know, I don't want to be the guy to say that you're playing a lower version if you've got a PSVR because like that version is still incredible. Like going through that on PSVR is still an incredible experience. There's nothing wrong with it at all. But I think you just have to be realistic in terms of the power that you have available to you. And if you can uh, get it on PC and sort of get a clearer image, get a just a better experience overall in terms of tracking as well. I think tracking is a big difference. Um, and like you, Steve, actually, I, I sort of gravitated towards gamepad uh, on the PSVR version, whereas in this version, I'm I only want to play it with motion controllers um but i think with, by having a psvr you sort of get um on certain games you get used to playing them with a gamepad it's different to pc vr there's not too many games that i really play on gamepad on on pc vr chris just um on that point actually because you don't own a psvr what do you play many games like if you had the option for example to play skyrim or fallout with a, a gamepad which you do actually you can do that um well you can play skyrim fallout skyrim, doesn't yeah. have gamepad support yeah, yeah. So if with with that option in mind, would you ever sort of consider playing it with a gamepad or is it all about motion controllers for you? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think I don't think it's the kind of game that I'd want to use um use that with. Like I had to use the Xbox controller to to do the character stuff. I don't know why it was real buggy when I played Skyrim originally, so I had to kind of use that for a little bit and then switch back to motion controls. I don't know what was going on there, but I mean, it definitely feels like that's a step up to use the motion controls, especially since like you still get the thumbstick and everything. I feel like if I didn't have thumbsticks, I would immediately want to use the controller just because just have that like precision of movement. But touch controllers for the win. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have you experienced any kind of problems? Like I spoke about last weekend with the touch controllers where you're moving, and I think a few people have, have referenced this as well, where you're moving in one direction, then you look down, and all of a sudden you start moving backwards. If you... Yes, is that, I yeah. hate it. It yeah. bugs the hell out of me. And so we've already got a patch. Um, well, it was in beta. I believe it's been pushed live. And I was surprised that that issue wasn't fixed in the patch. Because um, it seems like it's probably a quick I would think it's just a, a quick little bug somewhere that someone could squash relatively uh, quickly, but uh, maybe not. Maybe it's sort of rooted in a, a little harder than, than it seems. Yeah, some some people have been uh, altering the uh, ini files in order to uh, change it over to uh, head look uh, rather than using the controller to direct the 
part of it because it's weird it's not like it's not like it's onward where you can move the controller in any direction you want to move it is that but then as soon as you look down it seems to counteract that for some reason it's it's not a thing um but some people are getting around this by just changing it to head look direction uh rather than based on the controller direction um yeah which i've not i've not tried yet i, I will say that i think you know talking just controls i think fallout is possibly a a a better uh, control scheme. Uh, now the menus, like the two things with, with Fallout that stand out is mostly you have a gun in your dominant hand, and whether that gun is a pistol or a a freaking nuclear uh, launcher, uh, it's it's one hand. So it's really no two handed weapons. So your locomote hand is always free to just locomote, and so you you have a perfect sort of uh cohesion there um whereas with, with skyrim you know you have other things that you're doing w with that hand um and then with fallout you also have the quick wheel for for switching weapons whereas with skyrim even though you have a favorites menu you know i hit the favorite button and then it kind of pauses the action and then i have to kind of find the spell or whatever it is i want to switch to um so it's a little more more broken up so um while I think Skyrim is clearly a better performing game than Fallout, looks better, um, and all that, uh, I think I might like the the controls of Fallout a little a little more. And I, and I don't know that they could do what they do in Fallout with Skyrim. I, so there's a limitation there, but uh, I'm just kind of wanted to throw that out there. Okay, uh, yeah. So I guess that's pretty much uh, sums up Skyrim for us at this point. Anyway, um, there's one more game that we want to talk about this week, and that is Time Carnage on the PSVR. Um, now, I'll go first on this, only because I've not really played too much of it. Um, but I wanted to mention it because this got. Um, <laughs> I was I was a little bit harsh when I was talking to you guys um, about this um, behind the scenes. I was sort of saying how. I just don't want to play this game. It feels like just another wave shooter and it's coming at a bad time. I'll, I'll acknowledge the fact that this game is coming at a bad time for me where I feel like I've played too many very similar games. Um, and the fact is this game is sort of getting the brunt of, and, I'm, and I mentioned this, it's getting the brunt of two years of frustration of underwhelming games that are coming out for VR and wave shooters that are coming out for VR. Um, so I, I'm not saying that this game doesn't have its redeeming qualities. What I am saying is that I just don't want to try and dive in and find them. This is the problem that I'm faced with. Now, Anthony, is um, he seems to really enjoy this game. And actually, he's not the only one because um, Paradise Decay did a video on this as well. And um, he seems to really quite like it as well certain mechanics within the game and i can acknowledge that um the reloading mechanics and the management of your uh, ammo is probably one of the the main points of this game i've not dived into it enough to really get uh, to a grip to grips with those uh, little nuances within this game when i did go in um, and i played a very small amount of it all i saw was yet another wave shooter and i think over the past year and a half since we've been doing the show i think i've done my fair share of really trying to dive into certain games that i know i don't want to play and yet i'm trying to play them in order to get the redeeming qualities out of them and i'm sort of getting to the point now where i don't want to continue doing that um i feel like to a certain extent i'm wasting my time and it's unfair I, I, i'll acknowledge i'm being unfair to the developer in certain aspects of this um because i'm not diving in and not getting to grips with these nuances in the gameplay which eventually could probably actually appeal to me i don't know um but at this point it's it feels like another wave shooter with a very slight difference in terms of ammo control and this kind of stuff um so i'll just i'll just say first of all i've not played enough to give a valid opinion of it but um i don't really want to play anymore um and i, I read a, a a review on upload vr of this and i pretty much agree with what was in that review um from what i've played but that's not to say it's not got redeeming qualities because i'm sure it has um steve what, what do you think i don't disagree with anything you've said so you know i i don't know maybe six seven episodes ago we sort of uh i think you missed that episode gary um but we sort of talked about how you know playing games like do should we even talk about games that we necessarily don't want to play especially if we're jonesing to play uh skyrim and fallout and uh for me i've recently launched into elite dangerous but we'll save that for another week as well um 
you know, we, we, we play these other games and, and what I'll say about time carnage is it's, it's good for what it is. Like if, if I take time carnage and, and, um, Dick wild and high noon and I'm sorry, uh, guns and stories and uh, all the other wave shooters that we've played say in the last year. And I put them in a box and say, okay, this is my wave shooter box. In that wave shooter box, I think Time Carnage is a good one, one of the better ones. So if if we're going to critique a game and 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 sort of uh, talk about how the game is, I think it's unfair to say, okay, well, you know, compared to Skyrim, it's crap. Uh, well, yeah, compared to something with the scope of Skyrim, most games are crap. Um, so. Yeah, I would rather be playing Skyrim. I would rather be playing Fallout. I would rather be playing Subnautica, Elite Dangerous than than Time Carnage. Um, but but when I try to sort of give it, uh, put it on equal footing, um, I think Time Carnage is really good. It's it's pretty it's pretty polished. Uh, it's got a a, a theme, a, a sort of cohesion to it with the whole time travel thing. So it ex- you get all these different settings, and, and I haven't gone to all of the uh, time locales. So instead of of uh, being in a the, the way the whole premise of it works is is as the name suggests, you time travel to all these different locations in time, and and then it's a wave shooter. You're shooting zombies, you're shooting dinosaurs, what have you. Um, so it, it settles that sort of, you know, uh, element of being an arcade style shooter, uh, with just sort of disjointed levels. It, it explains that through, through time travel, uh, which is pretty good. And the sort of the key difference that, that you were referring to, Gary, is, um, instead of, of just being able to reload your guns like you would in, basically every other game uh you have these four pedestals and those four pedestals uh are are where your guns are sort of docked and then when you shoot your guns say you know um say you have pistols and you you run out of ammo uh you can't reload so you you throw the pistols on on one of the pedestals and it'll begin reloading and then you have another set of pedestals that you can pull uh, more pistols if you've chosen them or a submachine gun, a shotgun, but whatever you've placed there through your, through your loadout before you begin a, a mission um, is what you can grab. So it gives it a little bit of, um, I found that when I was choosing my loadout, I sort of had to think about it and I went with um, submachine gun on, on one pistol or on one pedestal and shotgun on the other. And then, um, I had a sort of a fallback, uh, on the other two pedestals and, and, um, it, it was, it was pretty, pretty clever. Uh, it, it made the game have this sort of, uh, nuanced and forced, uh, micromanagement to it because you couldn't just comfortably hit a reload button. You had to, to actually, you know, go out there, stick your hand somewhere and, and grab a different gun. So I liked it for that. Uh, in the end, uh, my critique is the same as yours in, in the grand scheme. You know, if we, we look at things on the micro and the macro level, the, on the macro level, uh, wave shooters are wave shooters. Uh, I don't think this is going to be the last one. Uh, I think the industry is getting better with wave shooters. Um, and, and we'll, we'll see improvements in, in what's and, and so forth. But I think in the end, I think we're also going to kind of be you know, take them for what they are. It's a wave shooter. Um, and we're going to want the bigger games. Uh, and, and, and that's where I am. Yeah. Uh, and, and just to reiterate my point originally as well, like um, it's coming at a bad time. If this was released at the beginning or even sometime within the first year of VR, I don't think I'd, I'd be anywhere close to be as harsh as I am at the moment. I just, I'm just sort of getting tired of these things coming out uh, again and again. And there's nothing particularly wrong with this game. It just, it, it, it's just coming at a bad time. I guess that's the best way to put it at the moment. Um, well, that, that's a good subject, though. You know, just, just in and of itself, it, it's. I know you last week you guys did a, a state of of VR, PC VR. You know, two years in. Um, but I, I think it's it's very valid. You hear a lot of people, you know, if you go to NeoGAF or something like that, they'll kind of say, "Well, VR is a gimmick. VR is a gimmick," and and a and a wave shooter is like an arcade game. It's a type of game like if I was having my kids' birthday party at a bowling alley and and you know you go to those things and you book the party room and they give you x amount of dollars worth of tokens for the arcades and it's you know fruit ninja. It's it's that kind of stuff. Um I think we're we've been 
exposed to games like like uh fallout and resident evil and wilson's heart and lone echo skyrim that that that's where we want the vr gaming uh dominance to be yet there there's still so much of a market because we're still hungry we don't have enough skyrims out there that that there's still a market for these indie and, and, and small developers to create these these quick arcadey type experience, and I don't mean to say quick in the sense that they you know in a long weekend they they make a game. I know I know they work hard, and and some of these games may take many many months and several people to complete, um, but it's still an issue, and and ultimately this is business, and and businesses have to make money, uh, so. I don't think we're going to get a lot of lone echoes that are built exclusively for VR from the ground up to uh, a certain quantity that we always have a lone echo type game in our back pocket, in our back catalogs to go and dip into. I think those games are going to be spaced out and in between we're either going to have to accept and play ports of, of mainstream games again, such as Skyrim and Fallout and so forth, or we're going to have to be happy with, with wave shooters. Um, another game you guys talked about last week, Beat Saber. Beat Saber is a game that I'm really looking forward to. I'm sure it's going to be fun, but it's going to be fun 20 minutes at a time. It's going to be fun when, when people come over and I'm like, Hey, you want to play a VR game that I'm going to play, I'm going to put them in Beat Saber. I'm not going to put them in Skyrim. So I, I think it's going to be good in, in that sense, but it's not something that I'm going to be, you know, playing for 20 hours. I don't think. Um, so I, th I think as VR enthusiasts, we have to understand the business and the economics of the, of the industry. And right now it's just not printing so much money that we can be so picky and choosy. Yeah. Yeah. Not saying no, you were being picky points. and choosy, by the way. <laughs> no, no, no. I think you've, you've got some good points. I think this space for such a wide range of, um, games in terms of sort of the these huge games these huge triple a games then you've got the the ports and then you've got the uh the smaller indie games i think there is space for all of those things i think my um i don't want to sort of bring it back to time carnage in particular on this point but i think part of my concern with games like time carnage is that we're getting too many of one type um and it's almost a cliche to say, you know, it's another wave shooter. And the fact that we are getting some very slight differences in mechanics and the way the games work, I think that's all positive. And I don't, I don't enjoy sitting here as if I have any kind of authority on this stuff and saying, this game is a bad game. Time Carnage is not a bad game. Um, so I, I don't take any pleasure out of saying that in my opinion, I just don't want to play it. Um, and I understand making games is difficult. If you're an indie studio, you need to have a certain number of resources. You can only do so much. You, you can't make a Skyrim. It's just not possible. So you've got to make what you can make. Um, and I think that's the difficulty when we're getting games like Time Carnage being played alongside a game as incredible as Skyrim. I think that's the, the it's sort of taking the two parts to an extreme and it's difficult to sort of... Um, get your head around that i guess yeah just, go ahead Chris. yeah i, I was just gonna say i, I kind of miss the days when vr was all like people trying new stuff because i feel like if it wasn't you know like you said if it wasn't a wave shooter if like indie developers are making all these co cool wacky weird crap like you know something really weird that we won't get with triple a then i think that's how indie will stay around for a while but if indie just keeps making wave shooters no one's gonna buy them so like they should really kind of you know, people need to come up with wacky, weird ideas that no one has tried before. I bet there's a lot that could be done with VR that people just haven't thought of. So I think that's where they should go. It's kind of upsetting that people just keep making wave shooters. But I guess you've got like quite a good perspective on this, Chris, because I know you're doing this kind of stuff. You know, you're just sort of doing game development um, as well. So you've got an interesting perspective on this. And you, I mean, more than anybody else on, on the show, I guess you've got a, a good understanding of the difficulties involved in making certain kinds of games and that kind of stuff. Um, so, I mean, you know, uh, does that make you more open to these types of indie games and that kind of stuff? Because you know the difficulties and I can imagine them, but I just don't know firsthand. Really. Yeah, I mean... I do know them, but also, like, I don't know, all, all the teams I've been on, you know, we can come up with really creative ideas that are, are real wacky. Like, at the beginning, like, when we start a game, I know next year they're going to make us make a thousand ideas in, like, a day or something and then narrow it down to, like, a hundred, then ten, then, 
they kind of finally pick something unique. Um, so I don't know if it's just like actually in the industry, it's harder to, to do that, harder to kind of pick like some unique things. But I know at least at, at my school and with my experience, it's been, you know, it's been a key part is, is thinking of something weird and wacky first. Um, but I could see how wave shooters would be like the easiest thing to actually make if you're like, I've never made a VR game before. You know, like I've never even made a, you know, this is like my first game as a studio. I could see then like something like Time Carnage coming out, but I still do think that there's, you know, room for experimentation. Um, yeah, it's definitely hard, but. Well, I think one of the, jump in if I'm, if I'm wrong, but I think one of the things that any developer, any studio has to weigh isn't just what can they make, but then what can people consume? So, you know, uh, if if um if you're trying to reach an audience and you want to sell to a, a higher throughput of the market then you're going to have the non-enthusiast you're going to have the casuals and if you have some sort of uh obscure or very unique concept that the casuals don't get they don't understand it or it, for whatever reason it doesn't click with them then then they're they're not going to be happy with their purchase or they're not going to rec whatever it's not going to sell as much so i think one of the things that makes wave shooters attractive is not that that it's a easy idea specifically but also that it attracts in general other than us enthusiasts it attracts a wide market of potential buyers because who doesn't understand picking up a couple of guns and shooting dinosaurs or shooting zombies like everyone gets that like you don't have to con teach someone what to do. Uh, whereas something, um, I don't know, we talked about Wilson's heart today. There were a couple points in Wilson's heart that were, you know, difficult to get past because you just simply didn't know what to do. So reachability, uh, same thing with just motion controls and standing in a room, you have to think of, of the disabled and the handicapped and the injured. Uh, you have to, so you have to really think about, about your audience. So even though you have an idea and maybe you're capable of executing on that idea, that doesn't mean that your audience will be receptive to it. So I, I think there's that element at, at play as well yeah that's very true i guess studios could go two ways like if you know if they want to make something weird and wacky i feel like something like oculus would come and be like hey we're gonna pay you to make an actual like game out of this but then you could go the way of like we kind of need an audience now we don't really have that much money we don't have time to experiment we should probably make a wave shooter just so we can actually get some income i don't know personally if i was like making a vr studio i'd probably go for like some oculus go gear vr type platformers or something first to like get you know start to make vr games and then i'd probably move to desktop i don't think i would i would focus on like a riff title first just because the market's not there like you said you know yeah i think a lot of these studios and developers are probably considered a success if they break even so they're able to pay the lights they're able to make payroll they're able to cover the complete investment and in the end they have they have learned they've gotten experience they they have a foot forward to their next game and it didn't cost, you know, 2 billion or 2 million lost dollars or something like that. So I think, I think a company breaking even on a project is probably a success, uh, at this point in time. And, and then those companies that are actually turning a major profit, the, the raw datas and, and, um, you know, all those games that we know have actually made money, uh, they're, they're probably fewer and far between. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, just one final thing as well, just talking about money in the gaming industry and this kind of stuff. I think um, I can't even remember which podcast I heard this on, unfortunately, but there was uh, this report that, that Grand Theft Auto V now has become one of the, uh, well, if not one, one of them, but the uh, sort of highest grossing piece of entertainment ever. I think it sort of grows something like $6 billion now, um, which is just absolutely ludicrous. It's not left the top 10 games charts for the last five years or whatever it is. Um, and I wonder, you know, will we ever see that kind of game in VR? I hope so. And will VR ever get to that point where it can sort of have, have those kinds of games in there? Well, I'm not supposed to talk about it. So I'm going to keep it at, at, at a certain level. But recently we had uh, Resident Evil 7 and Capcom had, had released stats that it's something like 13%. They've had over 5 million uh, uh, 
people play the game. And I don't know if that means sold. Uh, I, I think they're tracking it by who's logged in. So 5 million unique accounts have played this game and 13% of them, or maybe it's 8%. It's, it's, it's a big number have, have played it in VR. Um, and that 5 million number includes the Xbox and the Steam and, and other platforms where VR isn't an option. Uh, so within the PlayStation owners, it's uh, it's we don't know the number, but it's a much higher portion of the PlayStation community has played it in VR. Um, my point with that though is comparing it to to uh, Grand Theft Auto and Rockstar that there are games that sort of permeate the the norm. I think that was one of them. And if if Rockstar could port Grand Theft Auto Five to VR and it just be halfway decent, I think it would be overnight the most played vr game or damn near effective essentially you know sort of metaphorically overnight like it'd be very fast and it would just boom like most of the most yeah. of the vr community would give it a go yeah 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 it's um it's, it's one of the success stories it definitely is one of the success stories uh resident evil is in in terms of sort of what what's gone on but yeah i mean gta 5 is it's mentioned so often isn't it you know gta in in vr and it was one of the dream games and i think actually you know we, we've seen some of the dream games like uh, fallout and skyrim these are all the kinds of games that just work so well in vr so um yeah you never know uh rockstar might jump on board at, at one point in the future Okay, has anybody got anything they want to mention quickly before we finish off the show this week? Nope, I'm good. Okay, uh, well, thanks for watching episode 80 of VR Roundtable. Uh, please leave a comment below and like the video, and also leave a review on iTunes or whichever you know audio podcast platform you use. That that would be great. Give us reviews um, on those as long as they're they're good. I, I think that goes without saying. Um, but uh, anyway, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. Adios. Bye.